You know, I had this snazzy introduction that I'd written for Lorenzo, but uh, I don't think I can do justice to the intro that Graham did. Uh, so let's bring Lorenzo back up on the stage and just uh, introduce him again as the chairman of Geekdom and 8020 Foundation, the founder of Geekdom Media, and Amazon best-selling author of his first book, The Cilantro Diaries, with his second book on the way very soon. I understand. I can't wait. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Lorenzo Gomez. Hello. Oh my gosh, how about that almost billionaire battle royale we just saw? <laughs> so uh, before I welcome our next two guests, I just want to say, you know, uh, this part of the presentation is really about why we're here. Why, why did we ask, you know, eight, nine hundred people to give us a part of your Friday? And it's because of how serious TechBlock takes education. And nothing we do, nothing we work on really is going to progress or matter if we don't really work and fix education. And so that's why we're here. And I'm so thankful for all of you sharing your Friday night with us. So please, round of applause to everybody that's here. So I want to welcome our next two guests. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Mark Larson. So Graham already introduced Mark Larson. He is the chief external officer of KIPP Texas. And he was the founding CEO of KIPP Texas uh, and also a Trinity grad, so if there's any Trinity alum here, give it up for the great Mark Larson. I don't, I shouldn't say this publicly, but he's also the most handsome man in all of education. <laughs> and I promise that I wouldn't flirt with him too much, but it's gonna be hard. Next up is uh, Seba Ali, who's the CEO of KIPP Texas. And uh, she came with us today, and she's the reason that this event happened tonight. So, Seba, thank you so much. All right. Let's get this party started. I just, I just want you guys to know that I ironed my shorts for this event, and it was... And it was... And it the was, shoes match really well. And the, these are Kip colors. I just want you to know, just going out there. So... Uh, all right, let me get my handy dandy questions. The first question, you know, when I was doing my research for this, I was really shocked and surprised. This, th read this question for you that after you graduated, you were a high school math teacher. Uh, raise your hands if you did not know that. I was shocked. So, a math, high school math teacher, uh, first off, raise your hand if you're an educator in the audience today. Can we give a hand for all of our educators? Holy moly, will you tell us the story? How did that, how did that happen? <laughs> and how did that affect your view in education? You know, it's a little bit coincidental. Um, after my uh, sophomore year of college, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, you went summers. Uh, and I did one summer in uh, Quantico, Virginia. And shit, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I was like, I don't know, I don't think I'm cut out for that life. Um, and I petitioned to get out and to go into the Peace Corps, uh, and I was able to. Um, and so I went into the Peace Corps, was a high school math teacher um, in Swaziland, which is a British colony. So I was teaching O-level maths, very advanced math. Um, and uh, had two and a half years of a fantastic experience. This was in the mid 80s, so it's before mobile phones and all of that, so you're, you're really out there. <clears throat> and it definitely developed a lot of resilience, a lot of things that I rely on now. Um, and then I, you fall in love with your kids like any teacher. Um, and um, that never left me. And so then later, uh, when I was fortunate to become a philanthropist, um, education really caught me, and when I, uh, Seba used to work in San Jose near me um, and founded a school there. And when I visited Kip and her school, uh, I was uh, done hook, line, and sinker. Um, and so maybe, Seba, you can uh, talk a little bit about that first visit and, and uh, the, the cash uh, on the wall. So I started, as Reed said, a school, a middle school, starting with fifth grade, one class of kids, 75 kids. Um, in San Jose, California. And I started a school there because I was a Teach for America alum. 
And when I served as a Teach for America core member here in Texas, in Houston, what I realized was that my students, they were just as smart and just as talented as the kids at the wealthiest school across town. But they lacked opportunity. They lacked a community of educators, a community who could wrap around them and provide them the opportunities that they needed to graduate from college, to get that first fantastic job, and to have a happy life, successful life. And so when I uh, finished Teach for America, I decided I needed to start a school in my home community of San Jose. And way back then, you know, almost, what, 16, 17 years ago, there were very few people who believed. There are very few people who believed that kids from low-income communities could and would have the same success, had the same trajectory as the kids from the wealthiest communities. And here's the thing. We knew that they could because we saw it. Just as Ruby's done it, thousands of kids like her have done it. But back then, kid, people just didn't believe. In fact, when a classroom of kids took and passed the AP calculus test in Compton, we made a movie about it, right? Stand and deliver, because it was such a big deal. And when kids at KIPP were going to the very best private high schools and earning the very best and highest scholarships, 60 Minutes took hold and said, wow, what's going on here? This is so unusual. But we knew our kids could do it. And so Kip started going deeper and deeper into the communities that we served because we needed to prove that kids could do it. And so we started school districts. And the naysayers said, that's great that you can start small school districts, but can you do this at scale? And so from one school, Kip Hartwood Academy, we grew in San Jose, we grew in Texas, we're currently 52 schools here in Texas. And we have a big, hairy, audacious goal to prove to the world, because we know our kids can, that they can and will graduate from college at the rate of the highest income quartile in the United States. And we can do it at scale, serving 100,000 kids here in Texas. Woo! That's amazing. Seba, will you tell us a little bit more? I, I'm fascinated by it. Tell us the story of when you first met Reed and how, how did that go down? Well, I, I think it went down pretty quickly, actually. I think Reed walked into our fifth grade classrooms. He, uh, I think you saw a life lessons class where we put all the kids in one classroom together and decided to teach them together. Because, you know, at KIPP, we believe that 51% of our time is actually spent on character education, and 49% of our time is spent on academics. And Reed saw that, and about half an hour later, we got the biggest check, just a, a simple email. Hey, Seba, loved your visit. Here is, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> the easiest Yikes. money I ever raised. It was not as big as an open-ended two-to-one match. So I'm counting on this audience to uh, Who's in? give Who's Graham in? an opportunity Make some noise. to exceed my contribution in that day, because he is so generous. This is so awkward. <laughs> I'm sure it'll happen, Reed. I'm sure it'll happen. No pressure, everyone. Uh, Mark. <laughs> so, Mark, this question's for you. I remember the first time we met and you were telling me the story of you had graduated Trinity, you would started on the education journey. And what I always remember about it was you were telling me this really awesome story like a professional educator. But in my mind, I was imagining you like an education drug dealer. And I was imagining you creeping on the west side and telling kids like, hey, you want some education? Like, look at my car. <laughs> Because that's kind of how you told the story. And I thought, this guy's so hip and cool and handsome. Uh, <laughs> will you give us a little bit of the story of kind of that? The, that's the story of the, the birth of Kip here. Yeah, um, it was less creepy than <laughs> he imagined. A only a little, I think. Uh, 
so uh, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, the, the, I think the why is what matters. Is why did why did we start? Why did why was I creeping on the west side? Uh, <laughs> but what here, here was the issue. Like 15 years ago, we all got into this about the same time. And to Seba's point, like people made movies about low-income kids going to college. So there was no evidence in San Antonio. We, this is our 300-year anniversary in San Antonio. It's a, that's a big key. 300-year um, anniversary. There was no evidence that, that one school serving low-income kids could consistently, year over year, generate the best results in the city. There was no evidence of that. It had never happened. And so uh, about that time, I finished, um, I finished uh, my, my uh, a master's program in school administration. I went, to my school I went to my professor and said, well, how do I start a career in school administration? And he had a conversation with me that many of you have probably had somebody talk to you like this. And they said, oh, you have to start your own school. And in 2002, when this came up, no one was doing that. Uh, and, and I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, no one's going to hire you. And I was like, I just gave you $40,000 for a master's. <laughs> like, this, that was the deal. And, and this, this is going bad. And he said, I said, well, how come? He said, look, you're argumentative. You're impatient. You don't value uh, tradition. You don't respect authority for authority's sake. It sounds like an entrepreneur. I'm just a, a, well, we didn't have that word back then. So, yeah, and so, and at the end, he was like, and some of your ideas might work. And I was like, okay, a little feedback. First, next time you do this, start with that, and then say all the other stuff. But he didn't, we didn't have the word entrepreneur at that time. But he was right. I would have been a mess in the regular system. And I think the regular system knew that because I had applied for a leadership program at Northeast ISD, and they told me no. Um, <laughs> that aside, so you get out there and you start and you start forming a school. And yeah, I went I went looking for kids. We had to recruit our kids, uh, and so yeah, we I went to the West Side, where we we launched our school, uh, and I had to find uh, fifth graders. So yeah, I I did. I stopped my car, saw a kid walking on the side of the street. <laughs> I am not making this up. I didn't make it up. No, no, it, it, uh, And so I got out, and uh, I stopped my car and went up and talked to him, and I did not do the thing, right? I would have like, bought, I would have bought pirated, pirated hey, DVDs from hey, you. Hey, kid, you want some candy? I didn't do that. But, but I said, hey, uh, kid, can I talk to you? And he only spoke Spanish, so we switched to Spanish, and we went down the street. His mom worked at the Mexican food restaurant, and we went and met her and talked about it, and he made a commitment to be in the first class of Kip before I had teachers, before I had a building, before I had anything. Uh, but he said, look, I want to go to and through college. When he came into our school, he was reading at the um, 27th percentile and doing math at the 31st. Four years later, in eighth grade, he was reading at the 67th percentile and doing math at the 91st. Back then, we didn't have a high school, so we got, he got a full scholarship to St. Mary's Hall here in San Antonio, one of our kind of fancy private school. Took th th three via buses, two transfers every day there and back, uh, he was asked, he was so good at math and science that they asked him to start a tutoring program to help the kids who had been at St. Mary's Hall since kindergarten. So <laughs> four years later, he's got college acceptances all over the place. Um, and uh, he, he, had, he had a lot of choices, but for some things going on um, uh, with, with what he was facing, uh, he, um, uh, he was undocumented, and so he didn't have as many choices about where he could go. And I think this valedictorian of Harlandale uh, had just gotten arrested uh, and deported when he was going back up for his sophomore year at Harvard, which was, and so he was like, I can't, I can't go uh, to the Northeast, where he had gobs of acceptances. He went here to University of um, uh, St. Mary's, graduated. When we, I went to his graduation ceremony, when I went there, uh, we celebrated and then went back to the same Mexican food restaurant where his mom was still working to celebrate for his graduation party. He's now in medical school. Um, and so, round of applause for that story. That's amazing. So there, there are a ton of these. There are a ton of these stories now. And and so again, like back in the day, that would have made a movie. That that's not. And now we have tens of thousands of stories and hundreds of thousands eventually uh, of stories where uh, you know this is not an issue of of, uh, of uh, talent. This is an issue of opportunity. That's amazing. So I got to tell you this quick story about, uh, yeah, round of applause for that. 
uh, when Kip started re- when Kip started ramping up in Texas, I remember one day my mother told me she said, "If Kip had been around when you were going to school, I would have put you in it." And then she started describing it, and I was like, "Saturday school? Uh, thank God I wasn't around when I was there." <laughs> and uh, but she saw something really special, and I think she saw the innovation that you all have. You know, will you just share with the audience what are those difference makers that you all do that really make it such a special place that my mother has referred a dozen people to the school? You know, Reed talks a lot about how innovation is adjustments, tweaks to what's currently going on. And that's really what we believe at KIPP. I mean, this isn't a magical school or a magical formula. It is really taking the best of what's out there and making it better. So I'll give you an example with our KIPP through college program. We originally thought, well, that's great. 20 years ago, we thought, we'll get our kids to high school. We'll send them off to these other high schools because we don't have our own yet. And then we're done. And, And they'll be good. And what we started to see is that our kids were really struggling to matriculate to college because there was no one to help them with financial aid forms. There was no one to help them figure out what is the best school when you need to stay close to home or when you're undocumented. And so we started a KIPP to college program to help our kids get into college. And then we thought, great, now we're done. And then we started seeing our KIPsters, as we call them, drop out after their freshman year of college because they had to choose between either buying a full meal plan and eating or buying books for school or because of the social pressures of being the first in their families to go to college, many of them, most of them, or because they were struggling academically. And so we realized we actually couldn't do a KIPP to college program. We had to innovate again. And we started a KIPP through college program. And now we have partnerships with over 100 colleges and universities across the country We have persistence counselors whose sole job it is, is to go to our college campuses and work with our Kipsters who are in college, our alumni, and make sure that they graduate. And now our next innovation is to make sure that our Kipsters find their first successful job. And so we're constantly adjusting, tweaking, getting better and getting better um, because that's what it takes. Round of applause for Seba. Thank you for that. Reed, we started Tech Block as a, an advocacy group when Rideshare left, and you know I'm very proud of the, of the community we've built here that's not afraid to get dirty. Um, and we have an election this weekend. How should we view education and what's happening in education as we all go about doing our jobs and, and, and living our lives? I think I'm going to punt to you on that one for tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we are, um, it's just been in the last 15 years that uh, we, that San Antonio as a city has decided to own our own destiny. For a long time we waited and we, we kind of kept momentum, let it happen. And then people started doing some things, and we thought, oh, it, oh, it can be different for this. Rackspace was one of them. And we, we started to list, I remember when getting an email from you, when we were like, hey, we're in the top 10 in like 30 different things. And I, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I think you were like, I think, I don't know, I think you invented the term, city on the rise. That was a Graham Weston trademark, 19, uh, 2013. So Lorenzo invented that phrase. <laughs> City, but we declared ourselves to be a city on the rise, and we just said we want to own our future. And we're not going to wait for somebody else to fix it for us or to, or to become. We're going to declare it. And for so long, we're, we, we're, we're, a, uh, we're a low, we've been a low-income city. It doesn't have to be our future. We've been a relatively uneducated city. That doesn't have to be our future. We're a segregated city with, uh, with ethnically, uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic, we're the most segregated city in America. Today, if you live in 78207, which is about a half a mile west of here, or if you live in 78258, which is in Stone Oak, your life expectancy difference, difference is 25 years. 
That's real. This is not third world, this is our own city. How much of that is traced back to the options you have to lead a choice-filled life in education? We get to change also how we do education. We have an opportunity to do things like KIPP, and whether it's KIPP or IDEA, we really, or SAISD, we, don't, we really don't care what name is over the door. What we care about is how many kids woke up today and went to a great school that's gonna enable them to live out their potential. That's the thing we want. Woo! You're here. This is my last question, because we're out of time. Uh, this question I'd like to address to all three of you. And uh, I would say, put your teacher hats on for this. How does this audience engage? What would you tell them that, that what are the things that they can do right now to help advance the education movement in our city? Well, first, go vote tomorrow. There you go. Use your voice because your voice matters. And advocate for the things that you believe in for our children because they need advocates like you. Visit a school, donate your time, and of course, donate your treasure to match Graham's <laughs> challenge. Take his money, take his, <laughs> take money. his money. Use Graham's money is one of the yes. things you can do. Yes. Got it. But help, help us, help us take kids all the way through college. And you can do that by donating your time, by donating your money, and by voting and advocating for opportunities for all kids. I think just by showing up tonight on a Friday night um, for KIPP Public Schools, you're making a huge impact because politicians watch these things. And <clears throat> when KIPP has an issue, if they do politically, to know that they can call on you um, to come out when the time is necessary uh, is amazing. So the fact that you have their back is, is wonderful. Thank you. Mark? All right, well, that's it. So first, Seba, Reed, Mark, thank you for what you're doing for our city. You're changing lives, you're changing the destiny of our children, and we just appreciate you. So please join me in a huge round of applause. There is one. I, there's thank one you, thing. San Antonio! Thank you, thank San Antonio! You.